afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's uh, DDE teaching. Um, Sam is away surfing, so I've um, volunteered to host the session. Um, it's our great pleasure to introduce BJ Manivel, who's one of our staff specialists here at NAPI and ED. He completed his DDU five years ago and says has a wealth of experience in this area. So I very much look forward to your talk today. BJ, thank you. I'll hand over. Oh, thanks. thanks for having me here. Um, think I will probably start um, and just share screen podcast. Just hold on for one second, guys. All right, can uh, can you see the screen? Uh, yeah. Yes. Great. Good. Um, so. When, um, when looking at renal ultrasound, <clears throat> most of the time I do uh, emergency medicine related ultrasound after the DDU, that's all we've been trained in. Uh, we do a lot of abdominal ultrasound, not just uh, limited to renal ultrasound, more like a full abdomen scans. Um, so renal ultrasound can come into a lot of intensive care aspects when we looked into it. So we, I prepared this lecture last year for the DDU teaching session. I kind of had to modify a little bit for this year. I think there are a few things that's come up recently, uh, but the overall scanning techniques and indications are all the same. So for people who have attended last year, there might be some kind of duplication of those slides, please bear with me, uh, but I'll try to touch on a few new things that, that has come up is for the people who have just starting new. I know that uh, abdominal ultrasound has not been given too much of weightage in um, DDU, IC intensive care thing, but there are some aspects that you can actually, your with your echoes and all those things, renal ultrasound would actually be a very good um, um, symbiotic kind of uh, relationship with echoes. Um, so we'll, in this lecture, we'll go through some main indications when you wanted to do a renal ultrasound and some scanning techniques and the protocols that's commonly used in most of the radiology places. And what do you actually need to look for, like the pathologies or common findings kind of thing? And what are the limitations of renal ultrasound are? Um, I just put this slide in just to give you some kind of perspective in relation to it, because this is a DDU teaching session. These are all some of the questions that usually been asked in previous DDU exams for emergency medicine kind of for the DDU emergency. But most of this question, we can actually rip up and make a little bit of a clinical scenario that comes up as a nice CU based scenario. And we can easily throw these things into the picture. Very easy to do that. And you probably need, definitely need to know all those highlighted topics when we're reading about uh, renal ultrasound. I will try to touch most of them today. So um, there are some suggested reading books and materials at the last slide. Please, if you wanted to explore a bit more on it, just to look at the last slide of this lecture. Um, this is one paper that another, to just to put, put it into perspective for the cohort that we're gonna talk about. This is an old paper in 2003, um, just the role of uh, sonography, renal sonography. Um, so what they did is some like around 400 and 400 and odd patients and it, most of them are acute renal failure. And uh, what they found is like majority of them had some chronic renal failures and urinary tract infections and hydronephrosis and this and that. So that's the most common things that you're going to see in ICU setup. Um, but you can pick up the probe to look at um, renal, uh, look at the kidneys and bladder for most of these indications, more common being flank pains and renal colics. And you wanna know whether there is, there is any hydronephrosis or post obstructive uropathy going on there. <clears throat> and if there isn't renal failure, you wanna know whether it is an acute one or chronic one. There are features to differentiate those. And uh, if someone's got a hematuria, you wanna look in for cause for the hematuria. You could, renal scans are quite useful. And looking for a source for sepsis, and you want to know what the bladder volume is, is there a retention there. Then if you're doing a procedure into the bladder, you want to confirm the position of the catheters and all those things. That's another way to look into it. And um, if a patient's got a stent in, if you think it is slipping. Um, and other advanced things like looking for complications of pyelonephritis, like an abscess or something, or in case of trauma. Um, and trauma is a bit tricky. 
if you have an obvious hematoma, intraparenchymal hematomas, there are some changes you can look into it, but most of the changes are age dependent. That means when the trauma happened, uh, because clot's echogenicity changes as time goes on. So you're not expecting a single kind of pattern. It's usually a bit more heterogeneous and multiple patterns in traumas. Um, you would like, you would probably need to use a curvilinear probe with a low frequency, somewhere around one to five megahertz uh, with an abdominal preset. Some advanced missions will have a renal preset particularly. Um, and patient needs to be assessed in supine position as well as in some other position. Normally, we usually try to do it on some kind of degubitus, lateral degubitus, because it's, it's much easier to scan the kidneys from the flank region, more like where you feel in for renal angle tenderness. It's coming from the back, but because all you got is a separate skin and subcutaneous tissue and a psoas muscle, and then just off your kidneys. But if you come in from anterior or anterolateral approach, um, you're gonna get some bowel gas and all those things in view. So scanning from the back is a bit more better when it comes to kidney dedicated, if you can turn the patient. Um, and for each kidney, you need to get a longitudinal view in the midline and then scan fan through all the way from lateral, left lateral to right lateral on a longitudinal aspect. And you also need to have a look at for a Doppler flow on the long axis. And then you turn your probe around transverse, go all the way from superior to the inferior pole of the kidney. So some, some uh, institution recommend to take a video clip of the entire sweep from a transverse view from superior to inferior. Some institutions prefer still superior, mid and inferior. It doesn't matter what you capture, it's what you actually surveyed and what you actually come as an interpreter. That's what quite interesting, well, that's what the important thing is. So you can sweep a few times and take some sample images, that's fine. Um, and then when you come to bladder, you need a both transverse and a sagittal or long axis view of the bladder for volume measurements and identification of jets or if there is any pathologies in the bladder. Um, remember whenever we do a renal scan, especially if they are, the patient is more than 40 years of age. So you need to always think about AAA as a cause if there is, if you're worried about a back pain as one of the red flags. Um, just a quick uh, rundown on the anatomy of it. So this is just a cross-sectional uh, view of a kidney and a schematic diagram. Um, I don't have to tell you anything, Urias, there's a major calluses, just keep an eye on that. And there are minor calluses system. And where there you have some small papillae, the renal papillae coming up there. It's very important to know where the papillae is. I'll tell you when it comes to hydronephrosis. And then you got this pyramid shape pyramids. Um, and then you got your cortex and the capsule, all right? So in between, you got some arcuate vessels are all coming into. Um, when you want to take in any intraparenchymal flows, these are the vessels that we take some Doppler samples from. Renal artery assessment is a totally different ball game for renal artery stenosis and all this. And I'm not talking about that now. I'm talking about any intraparenchymal lesions and all those things. Um, so just remember this pyramids, the papillae, minor and major calluses for now, and then we'll go from there. All right, on an ultrasound image, you probably would have seen this like 100 times already. Um, that's the long axis of the kidney. Um, and uh, usually the marker is faced towards the patient's head side. So obviously this would be the superior pole. This will be the inferior pole. And what you got is the fibro fatty pelvis because it's got the fatty kind of uh, fatty content in it and the fibrous tissue is quite echogenic. And you got this hypoechoic, relatively hypoechoic cortex around it. And you got a hyperechoic capsule because of the fibrous tissue again. In between, if you notice these ones, there are almost like an anechoic structures there. They are not the calicial systems, they are the pyramids. Normally pyramids are quite hypoechoic or almost anechoic. Um, but when, um, when you get some nephrocalcinosis or something like that, then it becomes more echogenic. So um, if you go and moving on from that, so this image is again, same long axis of the kidney. But I like this image because what are we seeing here? Just to get you guys talking, anyone can talk. 
spine. Um, this is more like an anterolateral view because you got the liver. Acoustic shadowing some from, from uh, you just catching rib at the top there. That's just a rib. Yeah, thank you very much. Just a rib. So I like because it's very common that when we're scanning the kidney, we get this rib into the view all the time. It's very annoying to avoid, like, when you get this rib shadow. Um, you need the one way to avoid the rib shadow is you need to go more and more posterior or even to the back. Or you can actually move your transducer a little bit on this side and ask the patient to take a big breath in so the kidney will move down a bit. Um, but when you want to measure the length of the kidney, which is very important to do, we're not much interested in the width of the kidney, it's the length or the bipolar length. That's, that's what more important is. So when you measure the kidney, you can the middle. That's fine. It's not going to interfere with your measurement. But as this individual, then you might have to take a breathing movement and try to move this away to properly assess the gap where we're not assessing this end. Um, so, we'll, and this is the transverse view. Obviously, you've got rib shadows on both sides and your subcutaneous tissues and skin. And then you got a kidney in and the, with the pelvis in the center there. Um, and when you come into the mid portion, if to, uh, just to confirm it's a mid transverse, throw in some Doppler and then you can see some vessels coming out of the kidney and see that it's actually coming out. All right. So uh, there are some normal numbers we need to know about. Um, the bipolar length, it could be between 9 to 13 centimeter. But uh, you know, one thing you need to remember, if there is any discrepancy of one side to another, call it shrunken kidney, or if there is a like an enlarged kidney or something like that, the discrepancy you need to be at least two centimeter. Um, and um, renal cortex echogenicity, as I said, it's usually more echogenic than the pyramids up here. And the renal cortex is slightly less echogenic than the liver. I'll show you one thing. So you just need to remember this one. Um, do you know how to diagnose, of, how to, not diagnose, how to interpret, how to, suggest the liver is fatty or fatty liver is? Compared with the liver, compared with the spleen uh, density? Um, not the spleen's density, it's the cortex of the kidney's density. Right. Mm -hmm. So the echogenicity of the renal cortex should always almost be the same as the liver, almost. Usually liver is slightly echogenic compared to renal cortex, but not a huge difference. When you scan the pediatric kids, like when you scan those kids, sometimes it's hard to differentiate where the kidney and the liver is like, to, like separating. So because they're almost like the same echogenicity for kidneys, uh, for the kids. But when you get more fatty changes in the liver, obviously fat is echogenic, the liver becomes more echogenic compared to renal cortex. So whenever we scan, just have a quick look at the liver and the kidneys comparative thing, and you can come to an easy conclusion. That's how they say fatty changes in the liver. Um, and the renal cortex is less echogenic than a spleen. Spleen is a bit more echogenic as well. And renal sinus, I told you, because of the fiber fatty tissues, it is a bit echogenic, the renal cortex. Um, all right, the other thing we, you, you guys probably need to know about this more than us is uh, because you will be dealing with quite a few chronic renal failures than in emergency departments. Um, so cortical thickness is something easy to measure and it's quite validated too. Um, if you need to measure it from the, from the capsule up, up to the pyramid, all right? Just that area. If you can't see the pyramid, I'm sorry, there's some noise coming. So, uh, when you, if you can't see those pyramids, then you can actually measure what is called a parenchymal thickness. Right? So this has been usually been misinterpreted in most of the point of care setup. They just measure the whole thing and then they say that's a cortical thickness. It's not a cortical thickness, it's a parenchymal thickness. For people who have a problem with those pyramids around there, that means you can't differentiate that pyramids from the cortex. If they've got the same echogenicity, then it's better off just measuring the parenchymal thickness. The numbers are different. Obviously, it's almost like double, like seven millimeter and above for a cortical thickness is normal. And if for around like double, um, like twice it for around 15 millimeters for parenchymal thickness. All right, so um, 
So cortical thinning, obviously, like if it's less than seven millimeter or six millimeter, call it as like most common cause of renal, chronic renal failures and um, interestingly, severe hydronephrosis. All right, so we'll look into the hydronephrosis side of that first because that is something that we need to, as a clinicians, we want to know. Um, you all know about this grading system. Um, there are three stage grading system like mild, moderate, and severe. And there are five stage grading system too. Uh, but the three stage grading system seems to be more clinically applicable and interpretable easily. So people kind of stick on to the three, three stage grading, especially in Australian side. Of um, so the normal kidney, this is your major calysis, your minor calysis areas. And you can see the papillae area is nice and cupped. All right, even in mild, mild hydronephrosis, it's still nicely cupped, that area is. But if you, once you start looking at this area here, and you can see that it start to bulge up the other way, the papillaries. So that's, can you see the cursor? Yes. Okay. So the, the papillae, hello, are you guys yes, there? We can, yes, we can yeah. see your cursor. Okay, good. All right, the papillae seems to bulge on this side. So once it starts to bulge up that side, then it's a moderate hydronephrosis. And if you have a cortical thinning happens along with it, then you call it as a severe hydronephrosis. All right. So obviously it's all the major calicial systems are all bulged, the minor is bulged, but the papillae is still retaining. All right, in a mild one, but in a moderate one, majors dilated, minors dilated, cup is flipping the other way around. And in severe one, everything has gone really ballooned up with a cortical thinning. It's quite easy to, to classify this way. All right, so obviously it's been labeled as mild hydronephrosis. I'm not gonna argue with that. So that's your major system that's dilated, minus dilated, but you can see the cup still retains its shape for reasonable cortical thickness there. All right, so that's a mild one. And the moderate one, got majors dilated, minus dilated, and you can see that it's starting to flip the other way around. The papilla, so it's almost like the cauliflower kind of looking structure there. So that's a moderate one, but because it's still got a reasonable cortical thickness there. And with a severe one, it's everything has been quite ballooned and you got a thick, like thinning of the cortex. Excuse me. So that's a severe one. All right, question one, just to um, keep it interesting. What do you guys think about this one? Is this a hydronephrosis? Would that be more like a, a renal cyst, Jay? Um, Why do you say that? It's quite dis discreet and there's um, acoustic shadowing beneath it. Um, I mean, like enhancement, yeah. Enhancement, sorry, not shadowing. Yeah. Um, and there's no sort of dilatation of the minor system um, and it's quite discreet. Yeah, it's not involving this side of it and it's not actually going up and there's not much thinning there. All right, so what else could be, if it is a cystic structure, is the cyst gonna be urine? Is there any other cystic structure could come up in that region? Renal cyst. Could be what? Renal cyst. Renal cyst, yeah. Anything else we can think about? Okay, before we call that as the collecting system, is there any other structures could be dilated and coming up into the hilum or the pelvis region? Just vessels. Vessels, thank you very much. So that means whenever you see a, something that looks like an hydronephrosis, you always throw in a Doppler, just to make sure that is not like an AV malformation or something like a dilated vessels or something like that. So this is definitely not a dilated vessel. You can still see that there's no Doppler uh, signals coming from there and the vessels are all coming on a bit more superior to that structure is. All right, it is part of the collecting system. I can agree with that one. So. And because it's not really fitting into all the calis, it's not connecting down to multiple channels. Uh, when you turn around on a short axis view or a transverse view, all you see is just that area. There's no kind of minor calicial system dilatation at all. Can you appreciate that? Yeah. So just that major calis pelvis kind of thing, it's just been dilated. So in a CT scan, this is how it looks like. On a trans section, anyone wanna know what it is? This is just an extra renal pelvis. So, 
So this patient actually was a left side, it's like a left sided flank pain. We scanned him for, we thought it's a renal colic and ended up to be having a diverticulitis on the left side. And this kidney is a right side kidney, got nothing to do with the patient's symptoms whatsoever. All right, so this is just an extra renal pelvis. I'm just throwing in few possibilities that it's not an actual hydronephrosis that we're looking at. All right, trivia two, is this an hydronephrosis? If not, what it is? I want to say no. <laughs> and is it like <laughs> multiple renal cysts? So. Very good. So this is not connecting together. So you see that it's all quite discrete and it is usually in the pelvic region, isn't it? It's not in the cortex thing. Even if it is a cystic structure, it's not involving the cortex, it's more on the pelvic. This is like a, it's called a parapelvic cyst. All right, so they're not hydronephrosis again. So. You need to know about a few things. So that is called the hydronephrosis mimics. We'll come to the previous slide after this slide. So there are a few DDs for or mimics for hydronephrosis, a common being extrarenal pelvis and parapelvic cysts. Physiologically, like in pregnancy and a patient who had a lot of diuresis and post obstruction diuresis too, and in full bladder, all those things, they can have some hydronephrosis like dilated systems. Um, and the dilated renal vessels, severe papillary muscle necrosis, or some, some kind of reflex nephropathy. Whatever it is, you need to remember this one slide. Hydronephrosis does not mean obstruction, and vice versa. Not all obstruction would have hydronephrosis too. All right, so, so with that, like, let's look at this one. So what do you do actually? If you see a, something like a suggestive of an hydronephrosis, if you are in doubt, obviously throw in a Doppler and looking for, is there a vessel that we are looking at? And look at the other side. Is that something like congenital or extrarenal pelvis or something that's been bilaterally involved? Um, whether the patient's got any uretric jets on the affected side or not. I'll talk about uretric jets. It's not gonna break your diagnosis or make it up. It's just an adjunct. Um, and look at the bladder. If there is any feature suggestive of this could be an obstruction coming from the bladder side. Or if there is any pelvic tumors, that, that could suggest that it could be an actual obstruction going on. And looking for stones. The stones could be inside the kidneys or in the proximal ureter or in VUJ. We can't see stones in the anything up after the one third of the proximal ureter uh, up to VUJ in ultrasound because of the bowel loops and all those things. There's one place you could potentially see is where it crosses the iliac vessel. So where you can see the ureter, if it is dilated, it will, due to VUJ stone or something, you can see some dilatation on the iliac brim. Um, so when I talked about pregnancy and hydronephrosis, um, in third trimester of pregnancy, hydronephrosis is, is, called, is quite common. Do you have any idea which side is commonly affected? It's left. It's, it's, the, it's the right yeah. side. All right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the other left. All right. So, well done, Adam. <laughs> um, um, don't know the reason why, but it's very commonly you see that on the right side, mild hydronephrosis. True, true, mild hydronephrosis on the right side. It does not affect renal function. It's got nothing to do with the kidney, and it just, we, there's, we just ignore that there is a right side hydronephrosis there, especially in the tri third trimester. All right, so uh, just like if you if you got a pregnant patient and you're suddenly seeing a hydronephrosis on the right side, if it's just a mild one, just uh, assume that it's probably physiological with the pregnancy, unless you've got a solid reasons to think otherwise. Um, uretric jets, I talked to you about. Um, the value of uretric jets is quite debatable and to the extent that uh, people don't take much value for it. Um, so you all have seen uretric jets, I guess. It comes from the VUJ, one jet goes on that side, another one comes in shooting from the other side. Here I've just still, I've got a still shot of one uretic jet um, coming in. So, so what's, uh, what's the actual value? It's like what, what it means like usually you get like um, two or more per minute on either side when the patient has got a steady state like hydration state. Um, th the the problem, problem with this is like the presence of uretic jet does not rule out an obstruction. As you all know, 
par in partial abstraction, you can still have ureteric jets. An absence of ureteric jet does not mean it's an abstraction, mainly because it depends upon the preload condition of the patient. The patient is quite dry and all those things. You only watched it for a few minutes. You didn't see any, any jets, and then we're going to call it as an absence. So it's a bit of a, um, um, like, there's not much, much consensus in how to call an absent jet. Um, interestingly, if you have a partial abstraction, you get more frequent jets. It's mainly because of the back pressure about the stone or partial stone or something like that. It tries to let out a little bit of urine and then blocks it again. So you get a frequent, less effective jet. So the, right, the contralateral side will have a very good, solid, strong jet comes up and the affected side will have a frequent but less effective um, jets. Um, this is from RUMAC. If you, RUMAC is one of the general ultrasound book that it's been heavily, it's like a Gray's Anatomy kind of book. Um, so around at least need to be 10 minutes of observation in a steady diuresis phase, which is again, um, like a debatable, what is a steady diuresis phase is, uh, especially when a patient has been unwell, abdomen pain, how much is he drinking and eating? It's quite harder to know those kind of states. So at least you need to be watching for 10 minutes. Or if you have 10 contralateral jets, nothing on the affected side, you can say that there is no jets on that side. So that's by, it's an approximate kind of number and it definitely varies from one institution to another institution, all these things. So um, stones, obviously it's an echogenic structure um, because of its density purely and it's gonna, it can cause an acoustic shadow. It can cause an acoustic shadow. So we are seeing one such hyperdense structure in the calicell system inside the kidney and it's been measured as well. I don't know why we're measuring a stone. Uh, it's got no clinical value at all. Uh, but my question is, because you guys are all DDU candidates here, uh, why there is no acoustic shadowing? Is it like a, because of the density of it, is it made of something other than calcium and things? Uh, possible, is there any other um, explanation? Physics. Always physics. <laughs> Always. <laughs> uh, any other thing? So what what is the what is the nature of the beam? What what does the beam's parameter needs to be if it needs to cast a shadow? I mean just just yeah. One is the density, obviously. Is there anything else could be? Yeah, the beam width, um, which Very which good. is the lateral resolution, yeah. Yeah. So the structure of uh, interest need to be at least the width of the beam to cast a shadow. Mm -hmm. If it is smaller than the beam's width, then it's not going to cast a shadow because sound waves can go around it. So, so basically, so they're not going to have any shadow. So where is the beam width usually narrowest in a beam? Focal point. Very good. Where is the focal point for this mission? For this images. Is it, is, it the, is it the little green mark on the side there? Is that the, where the focal point is? Like, there's, no, there's no there's focal no, point. Is exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is the bloody sonocyte mission. It doesn't have a focus <laughs> control at all. They don't give you a focus control in sonocyte's mission. So please don't, like I shouldn't say don't buy it, but you need to, you need to be careful with this kind of missions. All right, so because you don't have a manual control on where you want to put the focus in. So this, what they assume, when you are having a 10 centimeter depth image, you are in structure of interest. So they wanted to put their focus somewhere at one, like two third level, somewhere up here. So because your focus is somewhere up in this region, the beams are quite wider when it comes down here. So you don't have a control on this, on this mission. The other possibility could be a slice thickness too on the other dimension. If the slice thickness is too much, the sound waves can come around anteroposteriorly. So there's two, two reasons why we're not having much of shadow. So remember, most of the intracalicial stones are very small and you may not get that uh, shadowing that you want unless you get your focus pretty, pretty good. All right, so just don't expect all the, all the intracalicial stones gonna shadow. Or, you can assist like just to confirm whether it is a stone or not. If you're getting some kind of hyperechoic structure, 
it's good. Have you actually even noticed this? There is another one here. So it wasn't even been visible, isn't it? Because it's not casting much shadows. Our eyes seems to ignore those things. But when we throw in a color Doppler, what is happening here? It's called the... Any some twinkle artifact, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's all any stones with a rough surface on tend to produce this kind of artifact. The, and the clear mechanism of why the twinkling happens is not clear yet. There are a lot of hypotheses for it. We don't have to go into that one today. Uh, but it, it helps to identify if there is a structure like a hyper dense structure with a rough surface there or not. So previously we didn't even notice that there was another stone there. It kind of helps us to identify those things. Um, Stones could be in the proximal ureter. This is the kidney where it goes to the lower pole of the kidney on a long axis with the dilated calcium system and proximal ureter. And there is something echogenic there and casting a bit of the shadow. Because we got this bowel gas blocking all the way, we can only see the ureter till the kidney is there. So after that, you can't see anything in. All right, so you could potentially see something there. And this is a VUJ on a long axis of a bladder where you can see some echogenic structure there. And we throw in a color, um, color Doppler in there. So I don't know whether there's a video or not. No, okay. Um, and we can see the VUJ stone even there. It's an echogenic structure. When we throw in a color, it produces a twinkle as well as that's a contralateral jet. This is the ipsilateral jet, the small one. You can see the difference in the jet's freak velocity. It's quite strong and this one is quite weak jet because that's the affected side jet is. And it's usually quite frequent as well. Um, so that's along with the twinkle on the jet together. Um, I kind of used the word for it before in the lecture. So what do you guys think about this one? If you see a kidney like this with a lot of echogenic areas, Would that be pus, like pyelonephritis? Um, mm. It could be a good thing, though, because of uh, air sometimes can produce this. Usually, he'll have a ring down kind of structure if it is an air. Um, this is more like an echogenic structure. The other side of the coin, apart from air being brighter, the other structures could be calcium being brighter, isn't it? Cal like a denser structures would be brighter as well. Um, these are the, this is called a nephrocalcinosis, as I said before where the pyramids get calcifications, all right? It's very common with these people, like in part of those, the MEN syndromes and all those things. So these, these patients are put, like more prone to have uh, sto stone formations and renal colics and all that stuff. So this is just like a, where the calcium is depositing, not casting much problems, but here it gets more denser and you're already starting to see some acoustic shadows coming up from there. They're all part of nephrocalcinosis. Um, moving on to bladder. Um, can do some volume assessment, jets, slides, stones, masses, and all this stuff. So I'm, I, I'm sure like you guys would know um, how to measure a bladder volume thing. So the suggested way to do that would be on a transverse view, you take the width. On a longitudinal or sagittal plane, you take two dimensions there. Measure the longest dimension first, and then you you take perpendicular, it's kind of, it needs to be perpendicular. On the deepest pocket, you take a perpendicular line from perpendicular from the previous line. All right, so we assume the bladder is uh, ellipsoid shape. Most of the machines got a formula of 0.52 as a multiple multiplying formula because we assume it's an ellipsoid, but it's not always. It depends upon how, how what's the shape and distension of. So there are some corrections you could do. There some people do it like 0.35 and some do it up to 0.75. There's a bit of a variation there, but most of the point of care mission and all those things got a 0.52 in it. Um, it, it can underestimate sometimes your bladder volume. Um, big stones in the bladder was very like not common, I wouldn't say, but not that common that I see, but it is there. Um, but more commonly what you see, uh, this is not a urinary bladder, this is a gallbladder. And you see the stones in there, and this is the sludge. Um, just to imagine sludge and stones are like a sand and, a, and rocks, all right? It makes a lot of sense. So sludge won't cast a shadow, sand, stone will cast a shadow because it's much more denser. 
this is almost like a science. The sound waves can go through those things. And you still got lost to a lot of posterior acoustic enhancement with this sludge. Um, similarly, in a bladder, there's one of four cases with a, a lot of UTI, recurrent UTIs and pus and all those things. So you can see almost like significant posterior acoustic enhancement with a lot of cells sitting in there. Uh, when you try to move to roll the patient, you can see that it just kind of slides away. Um, question again, is this a sludge? I'm going to say it looks more like artifacts. Oh, very good. What artifact? Um, maybe reverberation. Um, I I, reverberations need to come in like that, isn't it? From the top, from the something needs to be. This area is here. Can you see that? There is a little bit of a smudginess happening. Yes. I take that. That's because of reverberation happening between the tissue planes here. That's good. But what about this one? This is a side lobe artifact. Side lobe. Um, side lobe is usually a streaky line that comes all the way. And it, you can see what causing it. And then you can see that it's coming down from there. Um, mirror artifact, mirror artifact. I'm just not a mirror. It's going in all the <laughs> <laughs> So, okay. The question now is like, if that is an artifact, some artifact, I'll come to that. Uh, if it is a, whether to differentiate whether from a sludge or an artifact, what can you do now? This is your patient. You're scanning the patient now, and then we notice this. I'm looking different views. Different okay. Models. You're going to go, you're going to go long axis? Yeah. This is a transverse, okay, got a long axis picture. Reduce the gain. Okay, reducing the gain, it's a good concept though. Uh, what it really means is, you're just taking out some of the low, low intensity signals, that's about it. So I can make any structure to disappear by reducing the gain. That doesn't solve my problem. So I turn- Compression? Compression? Yeah, refract. Mm, closer, closer. Compression is a good answer, but very closer. So I turned my probe around. I still got it. Is that Reduce a the dynamic range. I mean. The dynamic range is almost like you're taking out the lower signals again, isn't it? You're yeah. making more black and white image. So, yeah. yeah. So again, it's not, it, you're just tweaking off the post-production side of it. Not in the real-time scanning. This is all post-production, post-processing thing. So... So you still got that, it. Is it a little bit like near field clutter? You know, near field clutter artifact that you get sometimes yeah. in echo. But that's mainly with the reverberation or with the with more like a, what is it called the grating lobes oh. kind of thing. Grating lobes. So, yeah. yeah, but it's not. This is on the, almost like a, oh sorry, go back. So uh, this is almost like a what, four centimeter deeper. Okay, this is a part of your what is it called a slice thickness artifact. So what we, in this view, what we are capturing is because if you imagine that beam's got a thickness when it goes in, it's capturing part of the anterior and posterior wall and just superimposing it inside there. Mm -hmm. When we turn around this way, we are capturing that side lateral and this side wall again into the middle. So that's just a slice thickness artifact. But, but anyway, it could be a sludge, but we still haven't answered the question, how are you going to differentiate whether this is an artifact or a sludge? Fan through it as well. What is that? Fan through, like fan through the, the bladder. I'm still not going to mm -hmm. get it. You will still, when we ever hit, the, hit that particular angle, you're going to get that. Roll the, the patient. Doctor. Just turn the patient around. Just roll him around. If it's a sludge, they all need to go on a, a be on one side, isn't it? It's, it's all clears off, this entire thing. If it's all sludge, it's going to go to the dependent part. Like how we did it for the pus thing. When you turn to roll the patient, you just turn the sludge moves away from that plot, but to, to the most dependent area. That's all, that's all you have to do. Just roll him to one side. All right, so it, it is actually a gas slice thickness artifact. Um, and we, this, is, this is a slide of Roger Gent. You probably would know Roger Gent by now. So uh, this is a slide of him. So all we need to do is just roll him to one of the lateral, left lateral position to confirm whether it's a sludge or not. Right. What are we seeing here? Bladder again, transverse. It's just a sweep through from anterior to posterior, whatever, from superior to inferior. 
um, it's a male patient. You can see some prostate down there. Okay, move on. So what do we have um, inside the bladder? Yeah, it's a large echogenic structure with a similar density to sort of soft tissue. Very good. And, and the different fields are? It's fairly heterogeneous with some stranding yeah. around it. I guess the number one would be a tumor. Yep. And um, if you wanted a tumor, then obviously they are quite vascular structures in the tumors are. So obviously we wanted to know if there is any uh, flow in it. Oh, sorry. I've given you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so when you when you throw in a Doppler, following commands, but he's not vocalizing. Mm. Lactate is going to four, mm. one two. Sorry, I'm just getting the multiple. Sorry. Um, so five. sorry, sorry, guys. You might just need to mute okay. your sound there because mm. we can hear you talking. Yes, yeah. I mean definitely not itself. That's definitely much worse. Um, so when we throw in a Doppler there, Doppler signal, there is no Doppler uptake there. Yeah, I saw is CO2 about 65. Yeah. Um, sorry, Samar, I think you, you need to mute your um, mic, sorry. Okay, good. All right, so there's no Doppler uptake there, so it's a bit against your tumor uh, thing. So this is actually a huge blood clot. Mrs. Yeah, yeah. Um, belly wise, belly is okay. Um, chest, he's got not much in the way of breath sound. You not doesn't sound like he's moving much so air. Probably they're not hearing you. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's not bad. So um, we've got him on high flow still. So, um, doing something, but um, in the morning while we were, he was moving around, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, I mean, he was definitely sleepy, mm -hmm. whereas like most mornings he's been awake. Mm. Uh, is that, is that so Samar? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, everyone else. It could be, huh? About, uh, so you can have a mm -hmm. bypass mm. uh, and end you need to be on free drainage. Yeah. Uh, oh, lactate is poor, but it's not associated it's okay. with any acidosis. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think it could be just, he's very hypovolemic. Mm. Um, yeah, you're not it's been okay as well. Mm. Yeah. Is he on timing and all that? Yeah, he's on. Okay. Um, he definitely, he's on turn every time for this thing. Yeah. So give some timing. Uh, um, Tamar, can you hear me? Uh, give a, uh, 500 of albumin or a couple of hours. Yes. Uh, BiPAP. And then I'll you reduce this computer volume, I think. Okay, okay can see. I start now? Yes, thank you. All right, so this is not a tumor because there's no Doppler flow within that echogenic structure. Um, so we, that's why we try to do that. It's just a still image, but just take my word, there's no Doppler signals there. So it's got this nice reticular, like a fibrinous kind of strands coming up from it. So they're all blood clots. So this is one of the patients where we need to use in a wire technique to get an IDC in because he's got a urinary retention and we couldn't get a catheter in with the normal technique. So this is me putting a wire in and just jiggling around the wire just to make sure the wire has reached inside the bladder. Uh, I would strongly encourage if you guys are doing the wire technique, you know, the Seldinger kind of thing where you put a wire in first, it's a flexible wire and then you put the catheter like a railroading on top of it. So when make sure that the wire has reached inside the bladder before you start shoving in the, the catheters. Usually we'll be doing a three-way catheters in because with this much of clot, you need to do an irrigation. So, so the, just be careful with that one, all right? So this is just the balloon, like a catheter balloon coming inside just to confirm that it has come inside there. So, and if you can actually check in the tip of the catheter, like stents, in where it is sitting inside, or is it just slipping into the urethras and all those things with that with the bladder scan as well, just to throw in a few other things. All righty, spot diagnosis. Could give you an example. That's a VUJ that's coming inside there. No take us. All right. That's the, uh, the ureter coming inside like in the VUJ into the bladder. And you can see that it's actually bulging into the bladder, the ureter is. 
you can see the flow diuretic jets coming from that as in as diuretic jet, which kind of shrinks down. This is a pediatric patient, but um, this is an urethral seal. Um, any, any, like if you start to see something like that, but most of, I don't know how many of you guys are doing pediatric ICU, but if you start seeing kids with recurrent UTIs, try to see if there is any congenital anomalies in those uh, renal system. So this is one car, child who just came into an and ED with after a few episodes of UTI, never had an ultrasound done for their kidneys in the entire process, like a few years time. And the GP has been treating repeatedly with antibiotics. So just on a bedside one, we found out that she's got, he's got some problems and he's been actually been fixed it surgically after that. So, all right, moving on. So this is a kidney. Long axis again, you can see how closer the density is between the liver and the kidney and the renal cortex. See, there's not much fat, fatty changes at all in the, in the liver. But when you look at the kidney side of it, there's no hydronephrosis, there's nothing is dilated. But where is the cortex and where is the medulla? Can you, can you guys kind of appreciate that it kind of merges together, everything is? Right? There's not much cortico-medullary differentiation between them. So, and if you watch it carefully down there, there are a few heterogeneous or more like an echogenic patchy area on the inferior pole of the kidney. This patient come in with UTI symptoms and fevers and flank pain, what was suspected as a pyelonephritis. All right, so all you see in pyelonephritis is a very, very subtle changes in ultrasound. Mostly no ultrasound features whatsoever. Uh, but as per book and all those things, but what you might see is a large kidney on the affected side, and we might lose some corticomedullary differentiation. There might be few hyper or hypoechoic patchy changes. Um, urothelial thickening, I never seen one, it's just all in the textbooks. And you might see some peridophric fluid around. But what we do in ultrasound in pyelonephritis is to look in for complications like emphysematous pyelonephritis or if you got an abscess. So this is one such example of an abscess where you got some kind of heterogeneous, almost anechoic kind of looking structure on the superior pole of the right kidney with a lot of echo, like a surrounding inflammatory changes there and with a lot of vascularity around it. That's a complicated pilot. It's kind of, they end up being an renal abscess need to be drained. So, Moving on, because of the time factor, it'll pro probably gonna be, go a bit faster, guys. Um, there are some cystic lesions that you will come across and there are some solid lesions gonna come up. More common being cystic lesions, all right? Um, there's one classification that you all need to know about is Bosniak, very easy to know, and it is qu quite um, uniformly used all around the world, right? So when you see a renal cyst from now on, try to put them into one of this group. You don't have to nail it down to exactly it's a grade three or anything. As long as you know whether you are sitting in this area, that's all good. Anywhere down there, you escalate it up and try to get a proper investigation done for those things. What I'm trying to say is if the, if the kidney, the, if the cyst looks pretty clean, no septations, no like a nodularity like this ones. So that's all good. They're all very simple cysts. You can have one simple septation, that's fine. It's grade two, still got no chance of malignancy with these ones. But once you get a bit more complex kind of septations and with calcifications and all those things, whether it's thin or very thick septations or really looking like a nasty mass like grade four, they're all got malignancy risks. Uh, being like from ED point of view, what I would do is as long as if it's one single thin septation, I'm happy with it. Anything above that, I will escalate it up, get a CT done and get a neurologist to have a look at it plus or minus biopsies, all right? Because renal cystic carcinomas are not that uncommon, all right? So if you notice this one, there is no, cla this classification is not based on the renal cyst size. It is just the character nature of the cyst. Size of the renal cyst doesn't matter. And this, right? So um, one picture of a simple renal cyst, sorry about the image, there's no contact there on the transducer. Uh, it's arising from the renal cortex on the superior pole and it goes down, it's quite anechoic. We can't see any kind of septation in that still limit. All right, 
this is a complex one. It's got multi-septations, and with a few calcifications and nodularity on the wall and all those things. So this is bad. So this needs to be worried. So uh, in your practice, when you're scanning kidneys, if you look at a cyst, just try to appreciate what's an, or what, how does it look like? Has it got any septations? If it's just a simple thin one septation, that's okay. But if there's anything more than that, assume it's renal cystic carcinoma and escalate it up, investigate it properly. That's all you need to know about the cyst side of it, all right? So if you other BDs for complex cysts are hemorrhagic cysts, infected like a pus, um, abscesses and all those things, and hematoma, and obviously this is a big gunness, renal cell carcinoma is, uh, nephromas would be another possibility, but we're not gonna diagnose those things on bits. Uh, but throw in this one picture of polycystic kidneys. Um, I don't think it's a big deal, but you, you, will, you will see it. And as soon as you see it, you know that's a polycystic kidney. Um, and you guys would probably see that more, especially with chronic renal failure and hemodialysis patient and all those things. They'll have a lot of cystic changes in the kidney. So um, solid lesions, moving on from cystic, you will obviously the big one again is renal cell carcinoma. Uh, benign one is an AML or angiomyolipoma. Everything else, you might see it very rarely after this. Lymphoma is another common one too. Um, echogenic, solid, well-defined mass inside the kidney, you need to worry about. If you see the same thing inside a liver, same kind of snowball, white snowball appearance inside a liver, that's usually a hemangioma, which is benign, you don't have to worry about. But inside a kidney, that's a different story. So because this could actually be an angiomyolipoma because you got myo, muscle, angio vessel, and lipoma like a fat tissue, that's why it's echogenic, um, which is benign, but RCCs can look echogenic too, All right? So we can't differentiate an AML from an RCC unless you get a tissue biopsy done in kidneys. Um, this is like, a, obviously, the RCC can form in different places, more like a complete cauliflower kind of mass, eroding and um, necrotizing kind of lesions. Uh, but it could be as subtle as this. So this is one thing quite nasty. We can easily miss this one if you're not paying attention to this kind of thing. So um, anything like an echogenic mass. So just remember that one. So resistive indices is something you guys should do more than us. Um, is um, looking at the flows resistance in the intraparenchymal tissue. So um, you all know the formula for residue index, I guess. Um, PSV minus EDV divided by PSV. That's what the formula is um, for residue index. So um, there are low resistance flows and high resistance flows. Can someone tell me whether what, what resistance flow this is? Hello? Sorry, what was the question? Flows throughout diastole. It, it, this, so. this is a low resistance flow or a high resistance? Low. It's a low resistance flow. Low resistance. Low resistance. Yeah. Thank you. Flows throughout diastole. Yeah, it got a constant forward flow in the diastole, the diastole as well. So normally what we see in a diastolic, I'll just throw you this image there. But don't worry about the allograft one. But normally around like 0.5 to 0.7. All right, so that's your normal ranges for kidneys. What, where we actually take it is one of those arcuate vessels uh, between those pyramids when running through. So you can take it from anywhere, it doesn't matter. And obviously resistive index is angle independent, only the velocities are angle de dependent. So you go more with the resistive index, index rather than a velocity when it comes to kidney because we're taking from a very tiny vessels that we can't go with an angle much. Um, so that's your arterial flow, isn't it? So what's happening down here? Kind of a venous flow because you kind of capture, because the sample gate is quite large compared to the arcuate vessels. You got the artery and the vein together, you would get some kind of venous capture as well. Which I'll come to that later on. So it resist, increased resistive index, where do you see that? Is multiple causes, including chronic renal failures, especially patient who had um, um, transplanted kidneys. So that's where the value of this is quite important, the resistive indexes are. Um, if we look at this image there, this study was done in 2013. Look at that one. This is about the mortality in relation to high resistive index. Resistive index of 0.8 and higher had a mortality 
of like blah, 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 three months, 12 months, 24 months with a ratio of five, three, and four. No different. So I think if you have a, tra- if you're working in a transplant centers and all those things, there will be a serial trend of resistive indexes to look into those things. So, um, but in an, um, there, are, there are documents about high resistive index in severe hydronephrosis as well. Uh, but it's still not validated that much to call whether they use as a parameter to call it as a CPM. Um, have you guys heard about this one recently? The Vexus? Is that is that quite familiar in ICU setup or not? No, not 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 really, um, Vijay, unless I'm just completely okay. ignorant it, and missing it. But. No, there's not some, it's not too, like it's recently, this is getting a bit more traction in, uh, in among uh, US uh, clinicians. Uh, um, so this is, uh, it's called Venus exam, Venus excess ultrasound examination or something like that. Um, so basically what they're looking for is this patient congested or not, or a bit fluid volume kind of an assessment. We normally do aortic VTIs or change in carotid BTIs and all those things with, with leg raise or volume, volume boluses and all those things. That sounds to be more validated compared to these ones, but this is getting a bit of a tra- interest recently. Uh, this is basically like looking at an IVC. If the IVC is more than two centimeter, then you move on to these steps. So you're looking at the, whether the hepatic veins are getting congested as well. You're looking at portal veins, whether it's getting congested or not. And part of that is renal vein as well. Now that I told you about the venous flow that you see, it normally needs to be a monophasic continuous flow. Then if you're getting it mildly congested, then you're getting more like a biphasic flow. And then with severely congested, you see pretty much lose one of the flow. It's just more like a dast- diastolic phase only. So just keep an, keep an eye on this like section of the vexus thing. I don't know how this is all going to pan out, but it's quite new in the literature now to come up. So uh, if you're doing, re- like, especially if you're doing hemodynamic assessments, you wanted to add on, if you think like you wanted to add on these things along with it. All right, with that, I'll stop. It's three o'clock now. So any questions? I was just going to comment on the Sorry, I just I just dropped you there. Sorry. I know. I was just going to say about the the Vexus um, ultrasound. There. I, I mean, I haven't. I've I've heard of it a little from Hatton because he's doing a research study on it. Yep. I mean, it's it's, it's going to. I, I, you know, my thoughts are is it'll be so useful in intensive care because we see this a lot, right, with our acute corpomonale patients, where they or any sign of you know RV dysfunction as well, and we're getting this systemic venous congestion which is um you know often we catch it when it's too late when we've already got organ dysfunctions from it so if we're, we have a, a tool like this where we can catch it early that would be um yeah, you know, yeah. if it becomes validated in the critically year it will be, be yeah it's useful. quite uh, even technically it's not that difficult to do these three measurements because you always do subcostal views and then you turn around to ivc from the subcostal view um, so on, on the way, then you'll see the hepatic veins coming into IVC, just in that spot. So we can take a pulse wave signal just in the hepatic veins to get this, this thing, the first step to this. And portal yes. vein is one of the big veins, like around 1.3 1, 1. centimeters it's big. It's like an IVC. So you can't miss that when it's entering into the liver on the right upper quadrant area. So all you need, that's quite easy to get a sample from there too. And the renal ones, we're not particularly interested in the renal artery or anything like a specific point. It's any kind of arcuate vessels in between. You can capture this one too. So it's actually technically not that difficult to do, but I'm, to be honest to you, I'm not sure how validated this is and all those things. There is a paper on it and everyone is talking about it and people wants to use it. I think by time we will know how this is all going to pan out. Uh, Perhaps after yeah. Hattam's research, um, the we use hepatic vein Doppler a lot, of course, um, in in echo in in an ICU. I guess the S wave reversal we're thinking there of of, of functional TR, right, with with dilatation yeah. of the yeah. annulus and as a marker of, of of volume overload and stretching of that annulus. Um, uh, again, it's 
I think, you know, once that's happened, we're often missing the, the boat a little. Um, so, you know, even earlier things than that might be might be of um, a value as well, I'm sure. But it's trying to find ones that are um, useful and, and robust at the bedside. It's tricky, especially trying to validate that in, in such a heterogeneous critical care population as well. Mm, mm. But it's still interesting nonetheless. And the renal vein Doppler, I think, you know, that's, that's, it's got to be a value, right? When we see, you know, we have so yeah. much... Um, that's right that's right uh, congestion like I, said, I, I think you guys would probably catch up on this to either to accept it or completely reject it before an ed physician would come to a conclusion on this one to be honest with you critical care would be the first one to to take it or drop it this one thank, uh, thank, thanks vijay hatam's just saying that it's, it's not validated in critical illness only validation yeah. in post-cardiac Post surgery yeah. Yeah, yeah that's more in the cardiac surgery people did this whole paper yeah Interesting. Anyway. Thank you. Yep. Um, yep. So thank if you there is that okay, good. So we got three slides, I think. What do you guys think about this one? I'm gonna say moderate hydronephrosis. Why do you say moderate? Um so there's um it's starting to get flipping of that um that. very good, very good. All right, but the cortex, cortical thickness seems reasonably quite thick. Yeah. So, and there is a more, yeah, mild to moderate. So the other thing is like in real time, if you look at any of the radiologist report for general ultrasounds, they don't use the word it's a mild, I don't know if they always say mild to moderate, moderate to severe, because some areas, sometimes it can looks a bit this way, some areas it looks bulged out. All right. So it's not an uncommon thing to use mild to moderate kind of word to, to use it. All right. So. Alrighty, this one. The renal cyst. Yeah. It's got a bit of echogenicity within it. Other DD, other differentials are? Abscess. Abscess. This is actually a case of abscess, renal abscess. Yes, it's because of the echogenicity with it. It's not a clean anechoic uh, structure. All right. So, all right. It is a cyst and a hydronephrosis combined. It? Yeah, I think this is also part of it. We get like in that image, it looks like it's not connected. Um, they are all part of the. But what do you grade it? To severe hydronephrosis, grade three. There's a bit of a thinning on this side, this side. Like, so I would say moderate to severe. Yeah, I would take that point. Any other pathology there, apart from hydronephros? Anything else interesting? Not a bit. Any yes, other There's a renal calculus there, isn't there? Very good, very good. Mm -hmm. Just sitting there yes. and it's casting a shadow. Normally, you need to have, because it's a cystic structure, it should be completely like a posterior acoustic enhancement, isn't it? This area should be. Mm -hmm. But instead, you're getting echo, echo acoustic shadow Yeah because of this structure there, all right? Anyway, so you know, there's another echogenic structure. I think this is what I was asking you about, and why it's not shadowing thing. What about this one, guys? Well, I'd be worried about potentially, like it's like you said about the echogenic structures in the kidney, always worry about RCC, or well, the one next to it. Is that just the That's That looks like a cyst. Yes, yes. And it doesn't have any septation. There might be a microcalcification there within it, but apart from that, nothing else. So this would be a grade one, one in Bosniak. Yeah, grade one cortical cyst. That's it. All right. So in summary, like it's easy to do. Kidneys are easy to scan. Usually, it's not a problem. Hydronephrosis. Keep it simple. Three grade system. We'll think about hydronephrosis. Mimics all the time. Uh, hydronephrosis does not mean obstruction. Uh, Pylonephrite is not so specific, but look for complications. Uh, calculate, look at specific spots, whether it's inside the kidney, proximal ureter, VUJ, bladder kind of thing. Uh, ureteric jets, use it with a pinch of salt always. Um, resistive indexes, just reserve it to transplant kidneys. Um, Bosnia excess classification, you need to know about at least with whether it's grade one and two, you're sweet. Anything from two F means follow up, F is for follow up, and then three fours are all medicament ones. Any solid mass in a kidney, investigate it further. All right. And don't forget to play. I never heard about renal, renal pain or anything like that. 
always look at the iota. Um. All right, so. Alrighty, guys, with that note, I will stop. If there is any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Vijay. I found that, personally found that wonderful. I learned so many pearls in that for me because um, renal ultrasound is, is definitely not my forte. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. If you learned something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for watching. watching.